I'm Denise Gagne, and this is my daughter, Stacy Werner, who's a very experienced and wonderful teacher near Calgary, Alberta. So Stacy was starting to talk about guiding questions and what are your strengths? Yes, so I just wanted to start this session off with some guided questions to help you figure out what's going to work best in your situation because all of our situations are so different. So one thing to think about is what can you do? So what are your own musical strengths and abilities? So do you have more of a choral background or do you have more of an instrumental background? And then using those strengths to highlight your students. Um, another thing to consider is your community expectations and your school expectations. So do they wanna show the students musical abilities or do they wanna celebrate the students? Because those two things are very different and very different type of performance. And then what is the goal of the concert or the program? And so again, maybe talk, one thing I just mentioned earlier was that you should go back um, and find out what's happened previously at your school if you're new and ask the teachers questions, ask the staff questions, ask parents and find out what worked, what didn't. And then sometimes it's even helpful if you have some YouTube videos of previous performances that you can look through from your school and see what you liked and what worked well. Um, are you going to be doing your concert to some sort of theme or a season? And then what venue do you have available to you? Uh, I know I'm in a situation where we are in a, in a community where we don't have an outside venue that we can go to. So everything has to happen within the school and we're limited in what we have for space and what we have for risers and stage. And I think we can keep going there with the guiding questions. Um, I'm going to jump in before we go on. I'm going to mention too, what can I do? Um, one of my uh, son's elementary school teachers was a really fine dancer and singing was not her, her strength. So her shows were almost all dancing based. And with the community expectations, if your school is used to Hal Leonard type musicals with big tracks in the background, I wouldn't jump in and switch to an ORF based concert your first year let it go for a year and do what they expect and then gradually shift them over to what you would like to do um, and the venue is massively important because that'll determine how many kids can perform in the concert okay i will go on from there okay um and then this is really important as well is what will your students know and what skills will they have by the time of the concert? So if you have something coming up with a winter program here right away, you don't have a lot of time to teach things. So consider that in your planning. Um, do you have a budget? So the school can't have huge expectations for you if they don't have the budget to back that up. So within what you have available. And then who is participating? Are you going to do the whole school? Are you gonna do some grade levels? Um, Michelle here, she's on with um, us as well today, and she's my teaching partner, and we work in a very, very large school, and we have to figure out a way to make things work so that every, every child gets a chance to perform, but our gym doesn't get too full because we only have a certain number of seats that we can allow in, in the gym with our buyer code. And um, Denise and John Jacobson have been so kind um, in saying that we can adapt anything you need for your concert from the music play and JJ and me scripts and songs. And Denise might want to add to that as well. Um, John and I are both 100% okay with you. Number one, adding songs, adding script. We're okay with you videotaping it. You don't need permission live streaming it. Don't need permission. You've got our permissions to do that. And um, if you want to do it as a little bit of a fundraiser and sell parents the video that you're making, again, feel free to do that. Um, I had another guiding question too. There's communities where there's not a lot of parental support to bring kids back for an evening performance. So if that's the case in your situation, I would suggest just hold your performances in the afternoon. All kids can participate. If not all parents can come to those performances, you can uh, record it. You can do a video of it and the parents can watch the video later. In terms of budget, costumes are expensive. Music costs money, sound equipment, lights cost money, and it should definitely not 
be coming out of teachers pockets. So either you have to figure out a way of asking for donations from your parents to the concert so you can fund the program, or you have to really scale back what you can do. Um, and do we talk about venues coming up, Stace? Yes, yes. Yes, okay, right venues here. next, okay. <laughs> All right, so some things to consider with your venue. Is the concert in school or in another location? And if it's in another location, you also have to consider if you're going to do um, rehearsals in advance, you're gonna have to book busing for things like that if it's during school time. And then also you're gonna need time to prepare that venue ahead of time as well. Um, consider your fire code and how many people can be in that venue at one time. And then that will, that helps me when I'm planning out how many grade levels I can have teach at a time or have on the stage at a time. And then also how many people can come to watch that child. And we often have to set a limit of how many people can come to watch. Um, are you gonna need to rent or borrow chairs? If you have a stage, is it going to be big enough? Do you need to rent another stage to make it work? And then a really good trick that I use is I measured out my stage and then I'm really lucky. I have a very big classroom. And so I tape out the exact size of my stage in my classroom and my students can then come in and see exactly how big it is. And I can space the kids out ahead of time and I mark everything with painter's tape on the floor. And then when we go onto the stage, I take that painter's tape and put the exact same markings onto the stage so that when they go onto the stage for the performance, they know exactly where to go already. And that's not something I have to spend time on in our rehearsals when we're in the gym. And also, I'm also aware that I can only fit in my, in my situation, I can only fit one class on the stage at a time. So we do a stage in the middle and then we do a set of risers on one side and a set of risers on the other. And I can have three classes then in the gym at a time. Um, so that's kind of how we've made it work with our staging situation, but yours could be very different. You could have a whole school um, stage and everything right in your building. Yeah, some schools are lucky enough to have theaters. I saw a really interesting post on Facebook a couple of weeks ago, and it was from a teacher who said, we have 180 kids in each grade, and my principal and I are talking about the logistics of getting them on and off stage, and the principal wants every child in the school to perform in this concert. And I'm going, okay, five grades, 180 kids, that's a thousand kids. That is absolutely not realistic. If you lined up 180 children and timed how long it took to get them on the stage, it's gonna take 15 minutes. And there's a class that has to come off at the same time. So that's a school that needs to consider doing one grade level per concert, not trying to do all the grade levels at the same time. Um, if you're lucky enough to go to other venues, again, check fire code. And you sort of have to take your numbers that you can seat and figure out how many kids based on that. So if I have 400 seats that I'm allowed to have by fire code, that probably means I can have 200 kids because most kids are going to have at least two people that are going to want to come and see them perform, uh, maybe four if they have grandma and grandpa. What I used to do in my situation, I had a lovely, great, huge 750 seat theater. And we would do a dress rehearsal in the afternoon. Our parent council was um, was uh, gave us the funding to bus the kids from the school to the venue in the afternoon. And that's when we invited a lot of the grandparents to come see the kids. And the kids would watch their own show at the same time. And then the evening concert was ticketed so that we didn't have too, too many people in. Um, and, and overfill the location. Um, parents want two things at a concert. They want to be able to see their kids and they want to be able to hear their kids. So you have, that, that's the two things. You really have to make sure that the line of sight everywhere towards your stage is good and that you've got a good enough sound system that you're not losing the children in the concert. Okay, go on, equipment. All right, so these are things you need to consider within your venue. Um, I kind of talked already about stage and risers. And then uh, does 
your venue have a sound system that's going to work adequately for what you want to do. Um, and do you have a quality system available? So what I have rented in the past for our school, because we don't have the quality sound system available and we have to go to a music store in the city and rent. Um, so we rent two stand up microphones, six choir microphones, or those are also called condenser microphones, a soundboard, two speakers, two monitors, and then different equipment is needed if instruments are being used. So if we've done ORF performances in the past, I will usually get a floor microphone and put that right on the floor so that we can hear the basses. And I put that right by the basses. Um, my gym does not have good lighting as well. So we have to rent lights. And I rent a lighting board, four sets of lights and stands for the lights as well. And, and then- oh, Can I ask Stacy? can yeah. I jump in? Um, what does it cost? For that and how long do you get that rental for it's going to be different wherever you go but for us um it works out to six hundred dollars per show approximately depending on what we need for our equipment and we're lucky enough that uh the store in calgary that we go to to do our rentals they put holds on for free for our equipment so i just phone a couple months prior and they reserve all the equipment for us so we know that we're going to get it for that time and um and they also give us school pricing as well. So it's a little bit cheaper. Yes, and then um, backdrop uh, for your venue. And I am lucky enough right now to have a digital backdrop, which I absolutely love. We can project that onto the screen, um, but this is maybe somewhere where you can delegate some of the work and have parents, teachers, and students assist with making something to display. This is something that um, many American schools have an art specialist in the building. Canadian schools typically don't. Most classroom teachers have to teach their own art. But if you're in an American school and you have an art specialist, I would become very good friends with them, take them out for lunch, and then recruit them to help build the sets, the props, the backdrop, anything that you want to do. But I have to say, I saw Stacy's show last spring. She did I Need a Vacation. And the digital backdrops were incredibly effective in that show. It looked it looked great and no painting, no building required at all. You certainly had the idea of what each scene was just from the image that was projected. Mm -hmm. uh, I never had lights, I unless I was at the theater and then the theater kind of did the lights for me. Yeah. Um, yeah, and we used the theater sound system and we borrowed a, a, a few additional microphones. If there's no budget, you have to maybe go to your parent group, your parent community, and maybe there's a parent that has some sound equipment for a band. As long as they can bring them in far enough ahead so you can test it out, um, I would I would borrow. Or if you're in a rural, a rural school where there isn't any music stores within easy driving distance. That's another situation where I would borrow, I think, equipment from parents. All right, and then um, getting into communication and scheduling. So just the planning of the concert is just one part of, or just planning the music and getting the kids ready is one part. All this communication and scheduling is a huge amount of additional work that generally the music teacher has to take on. And so we're going to talk a little bit later about delegating some of these responsibilities, but um, the communication scheduling, I do feel, has to come from you. Um, so go to your admin early in the fall, discuss how you want the concerts to be handled, and admin should make their expectations clear with you. They should also make them clear with the staff that this is not just the music teacher's big show, but everybody needs to be involved um, and in assisting in some way. And I know in Canada, I don't know if it's like this in the US, I don't know, but in Canada, this time gets considered their teacher's assignable time. So my principals will make this part of their job description that they have to help out in the evening show. Okay, so it's not a negotiable thing for them. It's part of their job assignment. And then for scheduling, um, you need to know your school culture and how to communicate the dates to everyone involved as soon as you as soon as you've made them, um, gotten them approved from your admin. Um, so our school does, we have a calendar in the staff room that we added on. We have a digital calendar that we add it to. And then also we have a weekly newsletter that goes out to the teachers and a weekly newsletter that goes out to the parents. So make sure to put that in as soon as possible so that everybody in the community is aware of this concert. 
And also consider um, even your community groups because we have some community groups come into our school in the evening. We also need to communicate when we're having evening concerts with them so that they know that they can't have their, um, their time in our gym during uh, the concert week. Mm-hmm. And then uh, I always prepare a concert week schedule ahead of time. I get my admin to approve it. And I also speak with my admin about some relief time because it's really, really busy week. And to be expected to teach and to run a concert at the same time is very overwhelming. So I, I've made that clear with my admin and my admin's been very supportive of that in the past of giving us some time. And I make the schedule a couple weeks ahead of time and it has all the rehearsals, when the show times are. And I also do try to give the teacher some relief time if I have room in the schedule. So I try to, but I try to keep it even. So if I can fit one prep per teacher in, I fit it in for the week. Um, and then I get it out to teachers and admin as soon as possible so that everybody knows what's happening. And then I continue to give it out. <laughs> so two weeks before <laughs> the concert, send it out again. Week before the concert, send it out again. I like to post the, the schedule in the gym. I like to post the schedule in the staff room. Um, I think even one year I posted it in the photocopy room so that everybody knew where the, what was happening with the show. Um, because especially dealing with the littles and with the little ones in, in the school, the teachers need to sometimes prep those kids for being in the gym and they need to know when things are happening. If, if we have a rehearsal that we need to happen on the fly, that can sometimes be very stressful for some of our younger students. So I like everybody to be very prepared of what's happening for that week. And it also helps me keep my sanity yeah. as well. <laughs> And, and Stacy always uh, sends me a copy of her schedule as well because she likes grandma to be there, one, in case one of her children gets sick, that she's got backup babysitting. And two, there have been occasions when I've been in the school, Stacy has to run and do something to the sound system and I can monitor a class and maybe do some warm-ups with them. So it's, um, it, it, you don't all have the luxury of having a mother who can... <laughs> step in and and uh, and help but I really enjoy it when I get the chance to come into the schools and uh, so keep scheduling me as long as as long as I can do this I will do it um, I was going to mention too that scheduling it's just a real courtesy thing to your staff to make the schedule and then stick to it it makes it so much easier for teachers to plan their week if they know what's coming and I have to admit that I was never the best at this. Uh, I remember one incident where I actually had a performing group coming into the school. It was an artist in residency and they showed up a week sooner than I was expecting. And God bless my staff. They just went with it and they didn't, they didn't, they didn't shoot me. So <laughs> I, I'm still alive and well, but uh, yeah, you can only go so far with the, the goodwill of your colleagues. And, so. and unexpected things happen, right? And um, having, a, I feel very blessed that I work with a staff that's very accommodating for that. Um, and, but then I also work with a lot of staff that really needs that heads up and that notice. And I know that their anxiety goes up. So I try to put that in place for them as well. All right. And then, um, I found that this works really well. And this actually doing this this year and really writing everything out for myself has that helped keep me a, a lot more organized too. Um, so thinking about backwards planning. So write out all the things that you need to do when you're gonna do it and who is going to do it. And this is where you can also start to do some delegating. So I assisted with Music Play Online and putting together some lists and these lists are gonna be edit editable, <laughs> sorry. And uh, so you can add in things that might apply to your school and you can omit the things maybe that don't apply to you. And my thought with this is if, if we're stressed before the concert, then it's not gonna be a positive experience for our students. If we're bringing in for frantic rehearsals because the kids aren't ready, the kids' anxiety is gonna go up. So the more that we can plan and be prepared for our students and more relaxed ourselves, um, the more at ease our students are going to be as well. And so these yeah. guides, we can go over them on the next couple of slides and uh, maybe talk, chat about some places too where you can start to delegate. So I, I was asked, uh, and this comes up quite often on Facebook. I have a concert. I see my kids once a week. When should I be starting the music? And this really depends on um, how well you know your students and how confident you are that they're able to learn things quickly. If you've been at the same school a long time, 
uh, and you're pretty confident that your kids are like super sharp, you can leave your teaching till a little bit later in the fall. But if you're new at a building, you might want to start that practicing much, much earlier. For myself, when I was picking holiday concert material that I wanted to perform in December, I didn't start it until mid-November. And that's late for a lot of other people. But I had my kids at least twice a week. Sometimes I had them a third time for choir. And they they were quick. They were They were quick learners. And we didn't pick anything hugely difficult. We picked unison pieces that I knew they were going to get very quickly. And because we'd already done lots of movement with our kids, I was able to teach um, the movements fairly quickly. So when you start is going to depend on how many times a week do you see them? You only get your kids once every six days. You better start now planning for that concert. And I think it also affects the, the program that you choose. You want to choose something easy if you don't see your kids very much and not choose something that's that's complicated and another thing to add to that too um one concern i always have is what if i get sick and i'm going to be gone for a week and so this year i'm actually going to start a bit sooner than what i normally would because we've had just so much illness going through the house with my kids being in daycare and school and so another thing that i think i put on the planning guide as well is filming yourself doing the songs and the actions and the movements so that you have a backup just in case you need to have a sub for a week and the kids can practice and so yeah we'll have that on the checklist there too all right, so the before the concert. So this is all the things that I guess we should be thinking about now if you're doing a concert in December. Um, so the concert expectation meeting with your admin, booking your concert dates, book your venue, selecting your music. You know, maybe need to order music. If you're lucky enough to be able to use things off Music Play Online, you can just download it, which is so easy and so fast. Um, communicating your concert dates to everybody involved. Um, if you need to rent a stage, if you need to rent chairs, sound equipment rental, um, starting to decide what you need to do for costumes. So as much as you can maybe get someone to help you out with costumes, you still need to make the decision of what those costumes are going to be. Um, same with prop planning, backdrop planning, uh, measuring your stage so you know how many kids you can fit on the stage, check your fire code, um, venue setup email. So at our school, we have a building manager who will be the one in charge of setting up the stage and the risers. So I need to communicate with him fairly soon about what date we'll need the stage set up. Communicate any gym closures and get those onto your calendar. Uh, if you need to book an accompanist, you might need to get on that right away as well. And then any instruments needed. And I don't know if Denise wants to add any more to that list. <laughs> no, I think this list is um, is pretty comprehensive. I think the, um, the booking of the concert dates is a very big one. and. For, for my schools, um, when I was here in Red Deer schools, it was typically done the year before. So those dates might already be set in stone. Um, if you're brand new at a school, check what is what has admin got booked for you or and, are they open and to And I it? think there's been a lot of too, like potential hesitation about having in-person concerts with COVID. So again, just getting the expectations clear of what's what's going to happen for this year. And I think we have to be aware with COVID, if there's a really bad outbreak in the school, your kids are all gonna be sick and at home. So you maybe want to have videotaping the kids in class as a plan B in case there is an outbreak. Let's hope there isn't, but you know, plan, plan for the, the worst and hope for the best. All right, and then the during concert preparation. So this is, for me when I'm actually doing things with the kids. Um, so I do prepare my choreography ahead of time, but then I see things happen and I need to make changes. Um, so then once I have the choreography solid, I'll film practice videos for my students and then that's there if I have a sub or if I'm sick or if I need the kids to practice with the classroom teacher and to, to keep the songs going. And then do you need to start to consider auditions if you do that at your school? Um, at our school, well, in grades um, three and four in the younger grades, if a student auditions, I give them a part. So that means often a lot of script rewriting because I have a lot more kids that want speaking parts than are available in the show. So then I have to do the script rewrites. Then I have to start getting the costume preparations done. So again, that's a place for me that I'm going to try and delegate that to somebody else this year. Same with the prop organization. 
um, do you need to start thinking about tickets and how you're going to go about doing tickets? Uh, at our school, we have the parents fill out a Microsoft form instead of handing out paper tickets. So it's more of like a reservation system and they don't actually get handheld tickets because my first year at this school, we did the tickets and it all fell on me again. And it was just so much work to get those all into envelopes and hand out to people. Um, and then also getting your concert week schedule, um, the cost com costume communication um, back to parents and teachers. So is there anything in addition to what they need? So do you want, what do you want the kids to wear? Do you want them to wear a solid colored shirt and black pants? Do you want them to wear a plain white shirt? Or if you're doing a winter concert, a holiday type shirt, a holiday hat, um, anything that they can bring from home. And then you need to assign the parts. You need to print the scripts. Um, and then I like to kind of gradually, as we're getting closer to the concert, add things in so that there's something novel every week. So for example, I'll tape the stage maybe three weeks before the concert and start getting the kids, I call it blocking when I tell them where they need to go on the stage. So after we've learned all the music, we go and we go onto the stage, we tell the kids where they need to stand and where they need to be. And then maybe a couple days later, I'll be like, oh, let's do props today. And we'll assign the props. And usually I try to assign the props to kids that don't have a job yet. So if they don't have a speaking part, get something into their hands, something that they can do so that they feel that they have a job. Um, and then microphone practice. I bring that in about a week and a half before the show so that they know how to hold the microphone properly. And they know how to speak into a microphone because if they go like this and they move away from the microphone, then we can't hear the whole speaking part and work on um, speaking clearly into the microphone. And then we add in the transition. So they'll start at their circle spot in the classroom and we'll practice. How do you go onto the stage and getting onto their spot and doing that as quietly as they can and then getting off the stage and where they go. And then also during this time, you can start to prepare your program if you do do a paper program. And also there was another thing that I should have added into there. And I have a, a crew of older students at our school that assist me with the concert. And they help me with the sound and the lighting and all the jobs inside the gym. And so I would also do a meeting with that group and have them come and watch a couple rehearsals so that they get to know the show a little bit before we start our concert week. Um, I've seen Stacy's shows. I think I haven't missed, I don't think I've missed any, maybe one. Um, and what Stacy does with her script is she puts it into a binder and it's on a music stand right with the microphone. So there's one microphone and stand on one side of the stage, a microphone and a music stand on the other side of the stage, and the binders with the scripts are there. Most of the kids have their parts memorized, but if they don't, they have that reassurance that the script's there and they can read it. And it's um, it's pretty adorable. The kids do a really good job of the speaking parts. The ones I always laugh are the ones that blah, 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 they finish up and they, they move away from the microphone before they finish speaking. And then you can't actually hear them. And I, I don't know how many times I've told kids, slow down. We yeah. can hear your words <laughs> a lot better if you slow down. Um, I'm going to mention for me, I didn't prepare the choreography in advance. I found I really got ideas from the kids. So lots of times I'd try the choreography with the kids, but it wasn't set in stone until I had had a few classes with them and, and tried it. Um, auditions, I did the same thing. I had a no, everybody who, who tries out gets apart and with my school choirs I never ever turned anybody away if I had 110 kids in choir um, that were willing to come out for practices that's how many we would have um oh and I should add for the speaking parts because it, it could probably sound overwhelming giving every single kid a part but I try to make the show so that each class has a specific scene so that we're practicing all those speaking parts during their class time I actually don't spend a lot of time over my recesses or lunch breaks doing speaking parts and additional work to do a concert. I try to keep it as much as possible during my class time. And so that's kind of how I've done it. So for example, if a show has um, a character that is throughout the show, like I have a Santa, I'll have more than one Santa. I'll have one kid be a Santa in this class. And then in another class, the next kid will be a Santa and kind of spread the part through different classes. It's never really seemed to bother anybody. So I just find it's an easier way 
to for you to manage all those speaking parts if you're doing it right within your class time. Yeah, and it seems it seems to work really well. The the way that you have done it. That the shows always look good and the kids they they know they line up at their microphones and they're they're prepared for their parts. Um, I don't think I, there's ever been sort of that lag when you're waiting for kids to say their lines. They just know them. They're really good. Uh, costumes. I am going to mention one thing. Reindeer antlers that go on like this fall off the kids' heads. So do the reindeer antlers that go around their heads like this. Get the classroom teachers to make them with a band and then cut them out. They stay on their heads a whole lot better. Uh, bunny ears, the same thing. If any of you are doing bunnies, John Jacobson's new musical, he got bunny uh, headbands from American Toy, I think. And it's elastic and it's fitted around and the, the bunny ears stay on the kids' heads a whole lot better. The headband type things, don't fit kids well, and they fall off. Costumes, same color shirt, same color pants, works really, really well. And I would sometimes go to a thrift store and buy a few extras to have them in case some child forgot theirs on the day of the program, I could just hand them a t-shirt and they could put it on and be the same color uh, t-shirt as everybody else. So that's another thought to make it more accessible if you're in a school where parents maybe maybe they don't understand english and they they don't understand the notes home mm -hmm. all right and then before your concert week so this is kind of the big getting ready before you actually get into the gym or get into your venue uh you're going to figure out when you're going to set up your stage and who's going to do that same with your sound system setup your light setup chairs I'll often get an older grade to come in and help with chairs um, and setting up instruments. If you're bringing in instruments, uh, you need to consider um, taping cords and different hazards that can come up. So if you're renting equipment like we do, we have a lot of stands that get in the way and a lot of cords that get in the way, get in the way in the gym. So actually a huge job every year is taping cords. Um, and then Denise is gonna talk a little bit later about some emergency supplies that you should keep on hand in your gym uh, or in your venue. And then um, your prop setup. I often will get a props table ready to go ahead of time. I'll tape it out with painter's tape and I'll label exactly where each prop needs to go. And then my grade five or grade six helpers can come and they know where to grab the prop from, who to give it to, and then where to put it back after our practice so that it's ready to go for the next show. Um, who's gonna set up your background and then schedule um, your communication again. So just get, everything out to everybody again <laughs> so that again. everybody knows what's happening and print your programs the week before because if you have any mistakes you still then have time to reprint if you do a printed program and i know yes. lots of people aren't doing it now you can yeah you know maybe have a qr code and parents can print it at home if they want yeah. the souvenir okay and then during and after your concert uh, you need to consider who's going to be looking after your sound. Um, I used to have kids do my sound this year. I want to take it on myself because it's been a little bit tricky to um, communicate that to the to the student helpers. So, and that's such an important part of the show. So I'm going to try and set up my soundboard this year closer to me so that I can take care of the sound. Um, lights. The kids love doing the lights. My grade fives and sixes. That's like the job that every kid wants. And then you need some runners. So if you're doing it within your school, you need somebody to go and tell the next group it's time to get ready and get lined up. If you're doing this in um, an auditorium or a separate venue, you're gonna need to figure out where those kids are gonna need to go and wait, and then who's gonna come and get them. And then who's gonna be supervising? So I mentioned earlier that part of, um, in our school, part of the teacher's assignable time is that they're there for the evening. So that's their job is to supervise their classes in their classrooms. Most of the teachers just set up um, some coloring pages and turn on a movie. And then when it's their turn to perform, they get the kids ready to go. And somebody to take video. And I should maybe add to that someone to take pictures as well. And then people that are checking the reservations or taking the tickets, you're gonna need people to hand out the programs if you're using programs. And then you're gonna need some helpers for cleanup. And then a new job, 
that has been coming up more and more since COVID is posting things online. So who's going to edit that video and upload it um, so that uh, the grandparents who live far away that can't make it can watch the show. And that's such an inclusive thing to do when, yes. when you do that. It's much appreciated. Okay, this is mine, emergency supplies. I've had this list for a long time. Um, paper towels, and that's because there's generally a puker in, in the Christmas concert. And it's not at all unusual to have some vomit. And, and it can happen in the audience too. I've had it happen in the audience. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and the leaky bladders. You know, no, no matter how, how much you try, it happens. So have some paper towels handy. I like to have a big garbage can right by the side of the stage. And and then if there is some vomit or whatever, I've got some rubber gloves, I've got some Lysol wipes so I can wipe things down. One year I had bought these beautiful flashlight candles from Canadian Tire. They looked gorgeous. And the kids in the class that was using, I think it was fourth grade, Shine a Light for Peace, one dropped it. And glass smashed and shattered all over the place and then a second one and then a third one it was like a a cascading thing that these um these lights broke one after the other so then we had to get the broom and the dustpan out clean up the glass so it was safe for everybody coming on the stage after and you do need some kleenex because you know kids have snuffly noses or whatever um, sometimes a little one gets scared and they cry and so you have to be be aware of that. Um, we should maybe talk, Stacy, about what you do with your special kids, because some of your special kids are good little performers now. Mm -hmm. But typically, I think having your special kids maybe off to one side of the stage with an aide somewhat close by is probably, again, a, a good strategy in case they have a meltdown and they need to go off the stage at least yeah. they're close to an exit and then also making sure that they are there for the rehearsals so that they get used to the lights and the sound and maybe some headphones if necessary um i remember one year we had a little guy that he just loved the moves but he would be so big with his moves and there wasn't a way to kind of bring him in when he was on risers so we actually taped out a box for him on the risers and that was his spot and he knew that that was his spot and he had to stay within his spot to keep everybody safe. And that's the way we communicated it to him and to the parents. Um, we want him to be there, but we need him to be safe. <laughs> um, and then sometimes I just find with some of our, like our students, um, they just need the right time. And when they see all the other kids in their class go up, then they want to join in. Um, and giving and being pushy or too hard sometimes doesn't work so it's really going to come down to you and the classroom teacher and communicating and figuring out what's going to be best and what's going to work best for that student and also the jobs often help too with some of your challenging students and giving them something extra to do and something extra to help with okay this, this, this was this yours is, right yeah. yeah this is this is another one <laughs> You have to prepare the kids with the what ifs. I've had kids faint on stage and this, I'm so happy that this one child didn't hurt themselves seriously because they were on, I think on the first riser, not on the second, but they fell and they fainted and they fainted face down, smack on the floor and they didn't break anything or have a concussion, but it could have been really, really awful. And after that, every time I had a performance on risers, I'd say, if you are feeling faint, sit down. Just sit down right where you are. It's okay. We'll understand. I've seen the kids turn green on the stage and I know they're about to vomit. And I tell them, if you feel really, really icky and you feel like you're going to be sick, there's a garbage can off to the side of the stage and you can go to that garbage can and puke if you have to, but we'd really like it if you got to the side of the stage before you puked and then we don't have to clean up all the floor. Um, what if you have to go to the bathroom? Encourage your classroom teachers or whoever is supervising the kids to have them all do a bathroom break at least 20 minutes before they're supposed to go on stage. And no soda, no pop. The water bottles are fine, but for sure don't let them drink soda or pop. So again, if they do feel woozy, 
sit down, put your head between your knees. At least they won't fall off the top riser. Um, have you had fainters, Stace? I've been the fainter. Oh, yes, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> so, <laughs> I haven't had a fainter, thankfully. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But it's, um, you know, sometimes it's hot on the stage under the lights and the kids are excited. So they're hyperventilating. They're not breathing. Uh, that's another good thing to remind the kids is to take deep breaths and mm -hmm. uh, that will help with the wooziness too. Okay, concert etiquette wrap. Uh, Denise Odegaard is a teacher from North Dakota and we got stuck at the Des Moines airport for about four hours one fall and we decided to write this and it's been in use ever since. In fact, I think we've added a little bit to it. and. Stacy has a child read it at the beginning of every concert. I had children read it at the beginning of uh, every concert because parents don't know what proper concert etiquette is. I will not forget when Hunter was in elementary school and I went to his holiday concert and there was a parent in the middle of the audience and when this one class came on stage, she goes, I love you, Austin, and she shouted out at the top of her lungs. If I was the principal of that school, I would have said something, even if I ticked her off, I would have said something because that's wildly inappropriate. And so with doing the concert etiquette wrap, hopefully it's proactive. And I think the new parts that we added were, if your baby's crying and it's really, really loud, please take them out until they're calm. This time it is allowed. And this was for that one annoying parent. Save the hoots and hollers for when you're at the game. When you're at a concert, it isn't quite the same. And the paparazzi parents, this didn't used to be a big issue, but everybody has a cell phone now and they all want that little video to throw on TikTok or YouTube. And it can be incredibly invasive. Those parents sometimes come up and they're right in front of you conducting. And so paparazzi parents scare the class that is performing. Please stay in your seats because all those cameras are alarming. Another thing we had a lot of in, in the days that I was doing concerts was we would often do them in class order. So grade ones would perform, then twos, threes, fours, fives. So after the grade ones were done, we'd have all the parents of the kids that had only grade ones leaving. And by the time the grade fives performed, the audience was sparse so we want we we got smarter and we asked them to stay till the very end and we would ask them to um we often would plan a finale number that would involve all the children at the end so that the kids weren't done after their little individual number i think the paparazzi parents i think if you tell them there's going to be a video on YouTube. You can download it or you can purchase the DVD or whatever you want to do. I think if parents know, know that there's going to be pictures done, there might be a few less of them filling up the hallways and, and taking the pictures. And then also with parents leaving, consider your length of your concert as well. Don't make it too long. Like I'm a parent of young kids. I want to get them home to bed too. And I don't want to be there till 8.30 in the evening. I want to be home at 7.30. <laughs> so um, if, you're, if you're working with younger kids, just think about your timing and how long your concert is. And think, think about the start time of the concert as well. It seems weird to start concerts at 6 p.m. But if parents have a long ways to drive and your concert's one hour long, they're going to get out of there at seven and they might not get their kids home till 730. They're going to be a little bit wound up and you're going to have a lot of tired kids the mm -hmm. next day. So think about your start time. And I, I really strongly encourage you to never go over an hour. An hour yeah. was sort of my max time. Parents are happy if they walk away wanting more, a lot happier than if it goes on for two and a half hours and they're just wiggly. Yeah. Okay, I think that's it. Um, I'm going to stop the share. Do we have any questions or comments or suggestions from our teachers? We would love to hear from you. I noticed that... Um, I think it's Maria Del Carmen might be on with us from Ecuador. If you are, please uh, unmute and say hello to me or put something in the chat because uh, Maria has shared her concert uh, videos. 
with me on a number of occasions and they're beautiful beautiful little videos of mm -hmm. her kids beautiful performing facility that you have at colegio menor it's pretty amazing yeah. Thank you so much. Hello, everyone. I am <laughs> Carmen from Ecuador. I'm so happy to. And thank you so much for all your suggestions and for all the resources and music play online. Right now, I am preparing a concert for December. And I am just looking for all the materials and everything. They are really useful. And thank you. Thank you so much. I really appreciate your help. I remember the first time you came here, <laughs> I had no idea how to do anything. And you were my fresh start and my angel. So thank you so much. And and I had a lovely visit with Maria del Carmen at her home in Quito, Ecuador. That was super special, super special. And if you want to see her students, look at the song from kindergarten, A Smile Goes a Long, Long Way. And they did such a good job. And we're so thrilled that we had your video to use. Any of your concerts that you're allowed to share video of, we love to have your videos. It really helps us to um, um, diversify, let's say, the, the website. It, uh, we get to show, and your kids are thrilled when they get to see themselves on the video. They really enjoy that. Okay, have I missed any questions, Carrie Lynn? Yeah, so I have a couple questions here. Um, how do you train somebody to use the sound equipment and the lights and everything? <laughs> okay, so my first year at my school where I didn't have this equipment available, I actually hired Morgan McKee, who's um, Denise's <laughs> sound engineer, to come in and teach me. And I asked parent council for money to pay him. And since then, my husband, he's very, very techie, and he takes care of our sound system. He gets it all set up, but we learned the basics from Morgan. And I know that that's not going to be available for everyone. Uh, so fortunately, nowadays, there is a lot available on, on YouTube and different ways to set up the equipment. Or if you go to your rental company that you go to, I've gotten help from them as well. So I hope that that helps. Um, but yeah, no, that's not part of my what I learned in university, how to set up sound <laughs> equipment. <laughs> so no. I had to learn that from Morgan. Yeah. Yeah, that's a tricky awesome. one. Um, okay, I have another question. So we have somebody who organizes all of the primary classes, um, and but doesn't really touch the intermediate. But sometimes the intermediate, what they present is a little bit, um, the word is terrible uh, materials. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you have any like suggestions or anything about how to approach other teachers or recommend resources? Um, in Canada, we have a code of ethics. And so if you have a problem with another teacher, the code of ethics states that you go first to that teacher and discuss with them. You never go to the principal or the admin to complain about them until you have had a chance to talk to this teacher individually. And I'm probably not the best one to do this because I'm not very good at helping to educate people who need more education. But that's really what it is, is, is if somebody's um, choosing material that's over the kids' heads or, you know, in ranges that are not good for the kids, and you can see it happening, you can go visit them and perhaps give them alternate suggestions. Look at this great musical called Starbucks by John Jacobson. This would be a great musical for your kids to do instead of choosing five pop songs that are an octave below middle C. Um, I would maybe just give them some alternatives. And especially if you have music play online, you've got alternatives um, there and available to you. Yeah, I think it comes down to communication and uh, uh, making suggestions and and, and making that suggestion of what's best for the kids and and making it about the kids because that's that's number one yeah and and again in the very first slide everybody should put on a concert that plays to their strengths as a teacher and i've seen teachers that do beautiful choral concerts and they are singers and they have lovely choral concerts. Um, I've seen teachers do the, the fun musicals like Starbucks or Bunnies where you have a script and a track. You get teachers who just hate 
anything with tracks and mm -hmm. they want to do everything with ORF instruments. And if that's your strength area and you can put on an entertaining performance that way, um, so be it. The ones I have the hardest time with, and it's typically classroom teachers choosing their own pieces. And they they choose, they, they pick a piece off YouTube and they don't consider the vocal ranges of the kids. So if you're in a situation where every teacher in the school has to do something, you might just send a note out to the staff as a whole saying the best singing range for children is above middle C and try and pick pieces that are going to work if you need some selections to get started, I can give you some. Um, that was that was the problem that I had the most when I was teaching was individual, every teacher in our school had to do one assembly. And invariably, there was at least one assembly a year where the kids were singing some pop song that was current. It was way out of their ranges. So they end up sort of shouting and not singing and it just sounded awful. Um, so yes, some gentle education would be helpful. Sounds good. Okay. Um, what grades do you schedule per night? And do you do multiple nights? Have you ever done that or anything? I have before. Um, like before we had a second music teacher at our school, I was doing kindergarten to grade five on my own. And so I would have to do one of my concert weeks would have to be more than one show. So I would have the ones and two, usually K ones and twos do one evening and then the threes and fours do another evening or uh, fours and fives. I can't remember exactly what it was, but yes, I did have different grade levels on different evenings. Um, we've decided to kind of make a shift with kinder and not do them in the evenings and make it more of a winter um, celebration. So they would come into the gym and sing their songs for their parents during the day, during their kindergarten time, and then go back to their classroom and do some winter crafts and have some snacks with their families instead. Um, I had done that for my kids preschool and I was like, oh, this is really good. I really like this idea and this works way better for kinder. Um, but then grade one and up, I do put them into an evening concert. And again, the evening concert isn't going to be a, a, a realistic possibility for every school. If your parents, um, I mean, I've got several schools near where our office is, where parents take buses to get to work and transportation even to bring the kids back in the evening is difficult for them. So if you can do that performance in the afternoon, even if the parents are working and can't come, they can see a video of it. I think that's better than doing an evening show where only a third of your grade fives are going to show up. And you really can't make it mandatory for the kids because it's after school and not all of them have the ability to get there in the evenings. So just yeah. about your day programs, did you get any pushback from people who are working? Uh, we haven't officially done this with kinder yet, um, but last year we did just do daytime concerts because with COVID, we weren't sure what restrictions were going to be imposed at the time. So we just did daytime concerts and then we made a video and posted the video and I didn't get any pushback at all. So it, it, I think it depends on your school and, and your community and what people want. So you could even gauge that and put a survey out to parents, maybe in, in the weekly newsletter or something and, and see what, what they would like. But you can't do an evening concert if all your students aren't going to be there. Yeah. And that's, you know, I, I think having kids sign a contract when they have a speaking part that as long as they're healthy, you know, with COVID, kids can drop like flies in December um, and flus, just normal flu bugs. Um, but sign a contract that that says I will attend the evening concert as long as I'm well. Uh, when I taught in rural Saskatchewan, we would have hockey teams that would cause me some grief and some problems because their coach would tell them, if you don't come to the hockey game, you get benched the next game. And so I had to actually phone the coaches and say, look, this is our Christmas concert. We only get one of them through the whole fall. You've got 20 hockey games. The kids can miss one. And, and there was times the hockey coaches were people that I worked with and I had to duke it out with them and get that um, that made clear that it was a community expectation that the kids come to the Christmas concert. That was in the old days. Now it's a holiday concert. Right. Of 
course. Okay. Um, we do have some questions uh, about the back plan list, if that's available to be shared. I can get that on workshops, but Denise, do you want to show the new unit? Oh, yes, I'll show where it is. So what we did was we put it on Music Play Online. So if you go into units, and I need to drag my screen across. Oops, oops, I didn't want to do that. Zoom always gets in the way. So if you go to Music Play Online and you go to units, and then go to programs. So all our concert programs that are available currently are on here. And right here is concert planning. And this is where you can download the guides. This is our formal concert permissions policy from themes and music play so that you can safely use the materials without asking us extra permission. And then here's the resources, concert planning as a PDF, concert planning slides. And this should be, it, it's the word doc because it doesn't open for me, it just downloads. So that's, that's all the guides available to you to to um, to use. We maybe should put a PDF of it up as well, Carrie Lynn. Sure, no worries. Yeah, we can put a PDF up because this is the concert planning, the checklists that you can go through. But I think those checklists are great. I think Stacy, you did a great job of those. And thank you so much for coming on with me and, and sharing this. Yeah, no, it's been fun. Um, yeah. I was just looking at uh, one other question about kids who can't be photographed or videotaped. And uh, one thing that I did was I actually phoned some of the parents and asked because um, our the way that our forms and stuff were set up, it was connected with social media and with um, and with the school it was all in one form. So I just phoned a few parents and I was able to get every single kid's permission to post on on YouTube just through our school website and only people who have the direct link. So the parents knew that I wasn't yeah. posting it right out to the public. So according to Canadian Freedom of Privacy and Information, FOIP is what we call it. According to the law, a public performance that's open to the public, you are allowed to video and take pictures. So that parents who come to the concert aren't breaking the law if they take pictures and there's other people's kids in there because it is a public performance. Uh, and, and that's what it would be considered as under Canadian law. Check the laws of where you are because they might be a little bit different. But yes, the permissions to video, the permissions to photograph should be checked and, and verified. And there are situations where kids want to participate. But, you know, I, we've had child custody situations where, um, you know, the, the custodial parent did not want any photographs of that child on social media. And I think in that case, you know, they maybe participate in the concert, but you'd have to have them off camera so that they weren't actually on the stage with the kids, but performing off to the side, if that was a situation. And hopefully parents will, will give you permissions to, to do that so they can be on the stage with everybody else. And yeah, I see another question too about um, if concerts are in the gym. Uh, what do you do in gym classes going on? And that's where my concert schedule comes in, where I've planned that out with admin. The gym's closed for the week at our school. And we're in Canada, and it's minus 30 outside a lot of the times during concert week, and the kids do their phys ed outside. <laughs> so, or they do it in their classroom, or I sometimes open up the music room, and they can go in there and do their phys ed if it's too cold. Um, but that's just something that's been in our school culture, and the teachers are aware of that. So because um, it's not realistic to be setting things up and putting things away and having expensive sound equipment where the kids are doing gym. So that's what I would do with that is talk to your admin about it. Yeah, and there's 400 chairs set up in there. They, they, have, they would have no space in that gym to be doing anything. And it's shut for the entire week, which is great. Okay, are you seeing any other questions, Stace? Uh, no, I think we got them all. Okay. I do just have one, if that's mm -hmm. okay. Um, so just talking about playing to somebody's strengths, um, we have somebody here who, um, they want to do a whole concert where it's just playing instruments because it's a strength, but worried about the backlash from parents. Have you ever had any kind of backlash from parents over what <laughs> you did? I, I think the parent expectation would be that children would be singing. 
So even if you're not a great singer, that's when you use recordings. My voice is damaged. I can't really teach singing very well right now, um, but I can use recordings that will be good vocal models. And that's that's what I would do. I, I don't think I would do a purely instrumental performance under middle school age level. I taught band for 18 years, so instrumental. And instrumental concerts are not quite as engaging as when you have singing and words involved. So I would encourage you to jump out of your, your comfort level a little bit and do some singing. And if you're not a great singer yourself, use the recordings because we've got some great vocal models. And don't forget, if something's going too fast, some of John Jacobson's pieces are quick. Um, you've got that little gear tool where you can slow things down. So if I go into programs and I go into bunnies, and the song is looking like it's a little bit fast, I can go to the gear tool over here and I can go to the speed and I can slow it down for my children to learn it. So we've got all the video support you need. I think you'll be able to um, teach some songs, even if singing, I've been teaching singing in classes. I've been, I was teaching all last week and I used my recorder to teach melodies um, and I use recordings to teach the song. So if I can do it, you can do it too. Excellent. And that's it. Okay. Well, thank you very much, everybody, for joining us. Maria Del Carmen, I need to come back to Quito and Kumbaya and come come visit your school again. That was Yay, you're welcome. so exciting. Uh, welcome. Yes. We have a school in Colombia now, so I want to go to Colombia and Ecuador and Brazil and visit all my schools. And we're home alone. And we're playing, actually. And this is my littlest grandson. Oh, yeah. Say hi to Grandma. Say hi, Grandma. Oh. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay.